In this video, we will not make fun of the terrible script, bad acting, my firearm is my friend, and ridiculous neurotoxin presented in this movie, no. In this video, we seriously analyze the threat that makes you want to kill yourself faster than you can scream, flower. We follow Marky Mark, look at the dumb mistakes he and his squad make and figure out what we would do instead to survive and ultimately beat the happening. New York is in chaos. All over New York, people randomly start competing of who can perform the most creative suicide. In the opening scenes, there is a lot of happening in the happening. We got profound observations, we got action-loaded shots, and we have Mark hitting on his 15-year-old student. Because your face is perfect. The problem is, your face is perfect at 15. I will not go into this. When Mark gets summoned by his principal, not because of his misbehavior, he is told that there has been an airborne biochemical terrorist attack at Central Park. The symptoms are confused speech, physical disorientation, and finally, suicide. And suddenly, I am very okay with COVID and PM2.5. If a fatal airborne biochemical is released, I think it is safe to say not to leave your house whatever the reason. Tape shut your windows and wait it out. But even with completely sealed windows, it is difficult if not impossible to make your home airtight. Once the chemical enters, you are pretty much done for. We don't know yet how the chemical is absorbed by humans, but most likely it's through the airways. However, for what we know, it could also enter our bloodstream through the skin. The best way to stay safe in this situation would be to get a military ranked airtight overall plus same level gas mask. Ain't no neurotoxin getting you in there. If you have an airtight bunker with a sophisticated filtration system and enough canned food for several months, then you may take use of that too until the situation has improved. Just make sure you can receive and send out signals to communicate and stay up to date. Also, you may want to store appropriate gear in there as well if you need to peek outside for whatever reason. Don't forget some Legos, mangas and well other sources of entertainment. <clears throat> in a movie Philadelphia gets evacuated, which is probably the best way to go for most people since the tools I have mentioned before aren't easy accessible for the average person, at least not prior 2020. But evacuating a massive city like Philadelphia comes along with different kind of challenges. Having a population of well over 5 million people, I am surprised there isn't much more of a mess. I mean if people are choking each other to get some toilet paper these days, I don't want to know what would happen in this situation. The biochemical gas has either reached or been released in Philadelphia by now. That is 3 hours since the first incident in New York. Logical conclusions are that it's either another separate attack or it traveled from New York down south. If it traveled down south, we can assume that the toxin travels around 40 meters per second given the distance between NYC and Philadelphia. That is pretty fast and impossible to outrun and still very difficult to drive away from. The dangers of an airborne attack are mainly caused by its unpredictable nature and incredible fast spread, both dependent on the wind direction, humidity and other environmental factors such as temperature which we have no control over. Interestingly enough, the chemical doesn't seem to affect animals as we can see here. Not sure what that means, but it sounds like what a scientist would say before he would solve the problem. The train that our characters took to get out of the city has stopped in the middle of nowhere. Everyone gathers at the local diner and we get to see another yet highly creative suicide. It seems like the neurotoxin not only makes people invent incredible ways to dispose of themselves, but it also seems to turn off any kind of pain sensation. Sort of like being in a trance state. If that's the case, then things start to look pretty grim. Because there is no chance of survival once it enters your body, so you better avoid any contact. The best way to do that is get the hell out of the affected area. Newest reports show that the only affected area thus far is the northeast and that it is probably no terrorist attack. If it isn't a terrorist attack, then the next plausible explanation would be the government screwed something up again and now tries to cover it up. In any way, getting as far away as possible is a simple thing to do. I personally wouldn't take any chances and drive up north to Canada and don't stop until I eventually reach Iwuchnik. 
that is here in case you wonder. But I wouldn't stop there neither, no. Once I arrived there, I would make my way further up until I have reached the land of Nunavut, so I can finally chill with some Inuit. Mark Wahlberg's friend has the incredibly heroic idea to go and save his wife who is somewhere in the middle of the attack. He decides to pass his 7 year old daughter to his buddies in mere seconds and drives off with a couple of strangers. I ain't got no kids but that's sort of the wrong priority lane isn't it? Your wife is a grown up woman stuck amidst a deadly bio attack. You are as clueless as anybody else so you are therefore completely useless even if you make it to her. And if you somehow can escape together, she could have totally escaped on her own as well. So leaving your daughter behind, I don't know man, maybe the toxin has already sabotaged his brain or he never wanted any kids to begin with and jumps onto the first chance to get rid of it. At first I thought she started screaming because of the people hanging from the trees, but then I realized she doesn't like math neither. I'm gonna give you a math riddle, okay? You're gonna tell me the answer. Jokes aside, using math to distract people probably won't work on 90% of the population. But if you need to get rid of them, you may try it. Mark's buddy here realizes pretty quickly that they are doomed, but let's be honest, that was pretty clear to begin with. When he sees the cut in the cloth cover, he knows exactly what's coming. But in my humble opinion, that's just freaking weird. That cloth is by no means airtight, meaning if the toxin needs such a huge passage to travel through, I don't know what those people are afraid of. According to the logic in this scene, the molecules of the toxin must be so huge you should see them with the naked eye. That storyline ended pretty quickly. Meanwhile Mark, his wife and the kid travel with an elderly pair. I love how they spot dead people just meters away from them, implying the neurotoxin is definitely around here, yet nobody puts in the slightest effort protecting themselves. It is well known by now that it's an airborne chemical that is wrecking havoc. How come none of these people use something to cover their airways? I mean at least you're actively trying to stay somewhere inside or cover your mouth and nose with whatever you have at your disposal. Those people do literally nothing. Ultimately, they take a different route and meet a bunch of other people coming from all directions reporting deaths everywhere around. Meaning they were in an unaffected area with casualties 360 degrees around them. If the toxin is literally all around them, it won't allow you to move anywhere. The obvious problem with that is that sitting tight in an open area will inevitably end in your death, it's just a matter of time. But if you can't move nor sit tight then what can you do? One of the best solutions would be to seal off your car and make it airtight, assuming you have the appropriate tools to do that. Let's calculate how long you could survive in an airtight vehicle before you die of carbon dioxide poisoning exhaled by yourself. Our character is driving a jeep with pretty large interior space. Let's estimate that to around 65 cubic feet of complete airspace. The average person breaths around 300 cubic feet per day. Thus, that person will decrease room oxygen by 0.75 cubic feet per hour and increase carbon dioxide by 0.5 cubic feet during the same time. We have 5 characters in the car, so we have to multiply the digits with the factor 5, resulting in a complete decrease of oxygen of 3.75 cubic feet per hour and an increase of around 2.5 cubic feet carbon dioxide per hour. Dangerous carbon dioxide levels are above 10,000 parts per million and especially dangerous above 30,000. If we take 30,000 parts per million as an arbitrary death point, then 1.95 cubic feet CO2 inside our airtight jeep would cause a potentially deadly carbon dioxide poisoning, leaving only roughly around 45 minutes before our characters would need fresh air. Suffocation triggered by low oxygen levels on the other hand would not happen until well over 60 minutes inside our jeep. But the group in our movie has different plans. We need to stay in groups, stay together. Thank you captain, thank you for your elaborate presentation. The people pack their stuff and begin their journey to Mordor, is what I would like to say but they are just heading to Arundel County. 
Basically, they have somehow concluded that the neurotoxin somehow targets larger groups of people and well, Arendelle apparently has no significant population. Mastermind right there. I can tell you, I wouldn't stay with those people by choice. My firearm is my friend! That were his last words. Seems like one group got wiped out, one thing less to consider. Mark miraculously concludes that it must be the plants and that the plants only target large groups, indicating why his group was left out. Sweet conclusion and definitely helpful, but it doesn't change the fact that the chemical that's making people act more awkward than normal is still airborne. I'm not sure what's coming next, but to me it is still very obvious just to wear the right type of protective wear and stay inside. Luckily, the next move isn't as stupid as some of the last few. Mark's group escapes to an abandoned house, and everything in that house is fake for whatever reason. Perhaps the movie is hinting on the mountains of plastic waste produced by humans. If it does, it failed. Also, Mark seems to have a little bit of a talk with a fake plant. Just going to talk in a very positive manner, giving off good vibes. If Arendelle was chosen because of its insignificant population, then this house should have been the holy grail. I don't see any reason to leave that place unless it's to gather food. Meaning they can easily go for another day or two without having any. Besides, when you have to abandon your home due to an attack or something of the like, you should always bring along necessities such as snacks, water, a knife and other essentials making your life much easier if the days to come look bad. The little girl gets hungry, so naturally they stop by a random house and have some fun on the swing hanging from a tree. I for a second forgot they are escaping an airborne neurotoxin. Mark and the two teens are checking if somebody lives in the house. In the next 30 seconds, the teens get shot through the opening in the windows by the gentleman owning the house. He didn't want our characters to enter because of the deadly gas that is lurking outside. Go figure, how about you get some new windows without any holes in it. This movie is like a project done a day before deadline. But our three characters continue the development of this sophisticated storyline and end up at another house. Whoa! This time a lone woman lives here. She lives off grid, grows her own food and has no electric line connected to her house. She could be Amish. She seems to be another brain dead character in this movie paired with some paranoid behavior. Our characters spent the night there. <laughs> if you had to choose between being an overnight guest at a lone old paranoid lady's house that's given off I'll poison you and eat you later vibes. Or spend your night outside while a poisonous toxin is going to kill you, would you sleep under a tree or on a field? Our characters somehow survive this night, but Mark doesn't seem to be able to avoid conflict with this creepy old lady. But he tries his best to establish common ground. Just hear me out. See, I'm a teacher. Apparently, telling other people that you're a teacher is a strategy out there. Rhetoric 101, establish trust. Luckily, this quick side story ends fast with Mrs. Jones smashing her head through the windows after the toxin has reached her. God bless her. It seems like the flowers don't care anymore if you are a group of people or just a solo traveler. They target you nonetheless. Mark stuffs a cloth underneath the door to prevent airflow. Kind of like a teenager that is about to light the joint but doesn't want his mom to figure it out. It doesn't work. But the greatest scene has yet to come. Mark hears odd sounds and goes having a look. He realizes that his wife and the girl are playing in the old field hut over there. Both places are connected with a speaking tube, allowing effortless communication. Close the windows and the doors, Alma. Why? Why? Really? You've been escaping an airborne neurotoxin for the past 24 hours. What the hell are you doing over there? I don't think this is the time to hang loose, especially when you know that the toxin that's been killing thousands of people in the past 24 hours is probably released by plants. You are literally surrounded by nature, and if that isn't enough, you are in an open field making it very easy for the wind to carry over any airborne chemical.
To be honest, if this movie is about nature paying back, I would have rather seen zombified flowers hunting people than seeing whatever the hell this was for 90 minutes straight.